um, last Thursday. And um, any any questions uh, right off the bat? Anybody have any questions about the material or anything? Uh, as you recall, what we're looking for is detection of coronary artery disease is one of the primary things that we're looking for. And detection, it comes in two, two uh, uh, strains. One is looking directly at the vessel to see that there's a stenosis or a clog in the, in the artery. <clears throat> and another would be to look at the muscle downstream from that artery and to determine if there's a perfusion deficit or a functional deficit. And these were the list of imaging tests that are done uh, in cardiology and radiology uh, to try and discover the existence of significant coronary artery disease with the uh, relative sensitivity and specificity. And rem recall what I said last time, these are generous estimates. They're sort of estimates made usually by people who, you know, uh, like the particular technique that they're testing. And so when you test these things in a very objective way, oftentimes you get different results for sensitivity and specificity, which we'll see uh, in an example shortly. So <clears throat> once you've detected the disease, can you do anything about it? One of the things that can be done is you can place a stent. It's a, called a coronary stent. And it's like a tube, a metallic tube, that you place inside the vessel and you expand that tube such that it has pressure against the vessel walls and it holds the vessel open. So if the vessel is closed down to a very narrow opening and blood can't get through, you insert this device, which is on a guide wire, you push it through the section of vessel that has the stenosis and you inflate this balloon and around the balloon is this uh, stent and it's made of metal and um, you know a couple of million of these are done a year and uh, it's it's sort of transformed what happens when you go to the ER with chest pain if they find that you have a significant coronary stenosis that so they can just open it up right away right? and there here's a cartoon of how it works so here's the significant stenosis in the vessel um, and so they were down to, you know, maybe 10% or something of the area of the primary vessel. Uh, you get across that stenosis with your guide wire. You line up where that device is with respect to the stenosis using markers on the, on the guide wire and on the device itself. And then you inflate a balloon and, and the stent opens up. And then what you're left with after you've inflated is this uh, scaffolding inside the vessel. And ideally, you endothelialize that scaffolding and the whole thing just creates a nice smooth new round or cylindrical vessel. Uh, there's a couple of, you know, uh, risks associated with this. One is you could uh, perforate the vessel with the guide wire uh, this whole device, you pull out all of your equipment and everything can re uh very quickly. That used to happen more often when these were bare metal stents. Now they're actually coated with uh, a particular material that makes them uh, uh, not prone to, to form and clot. So here's an example of an x-ray angiogram. This is, we're looking essentially uh, from the top of the patient through their chest this way. Uh, this is the spine. This is the catheter, diagnostic catheter coming into the coronary artery and injecting dye into the artery. And this is the right coronary artery. Remember you have two major coronary arteries coming off your aorta. And uh, you, you run along the course of this artery and you can see that it's not a regular diameter. It's kind of messy. And so that's the first sign that there's disease. And then there's a section that really dims away uh, quite significantly. And so there just isn't much dye through here. So that's considered a very significant lesion, probably greater than the 
reduction in diameter. These days what's done is called FFR, we'll take a look at that. You look at the pressure here, proximal to the lesion and, and the pressure distal and see what the pressure drop is across the lesion to see if it's significant. Uh, and then after the stent is placed, it looks nice and wide open, right? So it's hard when you look at these pictures, for me anyway, if, if this was a picture of my coronary vessel, it's hard not to want the picture on the right, right? Because it's wide open, you feel like, oh, okay, things are back to normal here. I can get on my bike and ride and whatnot. It's, it's been shown interestingly, so common sense would say this is the right thing to do, open that vessel. But when you try and run a clinical trial where you open half the vessels and then the other half, you just give them the best meds that you have possibly, the survival increase of the, the folks with the vessel on the right that's been opened isn't that significant. And uh, it's a conundrum, right? You say, whoa, you know, why, what's with that? Um, the symptom relief, when you talk to physicians and patients, is something that they uh, indicate is, is a major benefit of this therapy. And that is you stop having pain and you, and you can then ride your bike and things like that. But then they did a a study recently of symptom relief and it didn't seem that the symptom relief was much greater on the right either so but that study was only 400 people or something and it wasn't that huge but it's it, they, this whole field and and the imaging that leads up to it to decide do we do this in this patient do we put a stent in this patient that a lot of what cardiac imaging is about is deciding whether you do this um, and then the whole field took a, a, you know, a deep breath when this trial called COURAGE, it's an acronym, came out and showed that there wasn't a survival benefit. So if somebody wanted to review the COURAGE trial and related trials afterwards, uh, that would be a good, good thing to look at, um, just in terms of practical outcomes of imaging. The other uh, mode of therapy to revascularize the heart is uh, putting a um, coronary artery bypass graft in or cabbage. Say. And in, in this surgery, normally what happens is you do a sternotomy and you, you crack the patient's chest and you open up their rib cage and you expose the anterior surface of the heart. So you're looking at the heart. And then the surgeon will dissect out the left interior mammary artery. So there's an artery that goes to your, this part of your chest and I'll dissect that off. So you now have an artery sort of swinging in space in your hand. And you take that artery, which is coming from the chest down here, and you plug it in to the coronary vessel. And you plug it in downstream from the critical stenosis. Don't want to plug it in upstream. <laughs> Right, because all you'll do is put more blood where you can't get through. So you go downstream and then that perfuses uh, the heart. And this is very successful, this surgery. Um, it relieves symptoms, people seem to live longer. Um, and so that's, it's, a, it's a good surgery. The alternative is to take a vein graft. So you take a vein from somewhere else in the body and you attach it at both ends. You attach one end to the aorta, so you put, make a little nick in the aorta and attach the vein graft to there so that float blood can come through the vein graft from the aorta. And then you plug in the distal end into the coronary vessel. And this is called an anastomosis here. And so surgeons become very good at making a little cut, putting the vessel down and sewing it on such that the flow is, is good, right? And so cardiac surgeons, you know, the cabbage surgery is, was a huge thing in cardiac surgery, I don't know, a million a year or something are done. Uh, surgeons become exceptionally good at this operation. Like some of them can do six a day, 10 a day uh, because they set the patient up and then the surgeon comes in the, for the final like anastomosis and gets that part right. 
and all of the other stuff has been done sort of to get it set up. So these, you know, when somebody goes in for a triple bypass surgery, you have three of these things plugged into very cor various coronaries, etc. Very successful. Uh, imaging can be used post surgical recovery to make sure that the graft itself is open and blood flow is going through it and that the anastomosis is fine and everything's in, in good shape. The vein grafts unfortunately don't last as long as the lima artery. The artery will last pretty well forever. It's under the correct pressure, it's under the correct flows. The vein graft itself will start to break down after a decade or so. You'll start getting aneurysms and it will block off and things like that. So it's not as um, hardy as the, the lima uh, stenosis. Okay, going back to um, imaging and trying to decide who should get either cabbage or uh, a stent, you have to uh, understand whether or not the flow has been reduced through that lesion. Ideally, if you see a lesion on the x-ray or you see a lesion on CT, uh, you'd like to know if, if, you're, if the stenosis is called a critical stenosis, and that means that blood flow will drop down under stress. And a number of perfusion uh, imaging techniques are available, and we'll study those. Uh, this set of images is from MR perfusion, uh, where uh, a contrast agent is injected into the vein of the patient and you take subsequent MR pictures over time and you measure the signal intensity in a region of interest in the heart. And you can plot that signal intensity as a function of time and figure out what the flow is to that region of tissue. Right? So the imaging brightness in, in magnetic resonance with these contrast agents, and you use what's called T1 weighted imaging, the imaging brightness goes up if there's more contrast there. So if the contrast flows into tissue, the, the signal intensity will go up. This, so to analyze what the flow is, you can look at the slope of the increase of signal over time. Uh, you can look time to peak. How long does it take for the signal to peak? Uh, so there's a, a set of analyses, uh, uh, methods used to actually measure the, the flow. And ideally, you would like to know the flow in, you know, basically milliliters per minute or, you know, milliliters per gram per minute uh, in, in the tissue. <coughs> The interesting thing about the heart is if you exercise, so at rest, your baseline flow is about one mil per gram per minute, right? That, that flows through a, a chunk of tissue in your heart, right? So the, the amount of blood that's passing through that chunk of tissue is about one mil per gram per minute, right? When you exercise, it goes up to about five, right? So it's a five X increase in flow. And that's why when you exercise, if it only goes up to two, because you, you have a stenosis, then you, you feel it, right? The tissue is not getting the oxygen that it is demanding. That's called ischemia. A perfusion deficit can also be seen on CT scans. So these are a, a set of CT scans at different positions in the heart from the base up towards the valve plane down towards the pointy bit, the apex of the heart. And you can see that the contrast agent has gone into most of the myocardium in the, in the short axis image here, but there is a segment in which the contrast agent does not seem to have flowed in there, right? And so that's just a perfusion deficit. You can measure that in a single time frame if you're confident that you're at the right time after injection just with one time frame, one image, you can see a perfusion deficit. And the reason this is significant is because not, even though a lesion can have the same geometry, so in a coronary, you may reduce the diameter of the coronary by say 
right? So we're down to 25% diameter in the coronary artery. And you can see that on the x-ray angio. We see it on the CT. In patient one, that will be a significant stenosis. In the, when you stress the patient, they'll have a critical drop in flow. In patient two, it isn't significant. And so it's exactly the same geometry of stenosis. However, in the second patient, for whatever reason, usually because they have some other source of flow to the region that that vessel is going to, so it's collateral flow, for example. So you stress that patient, and they don't have ischemia, right? And so you want to treat the first person who has the ischemia. It isn't necessarily a good idea to treat the second person with a stent or a bypass because they don't get ischemia, right? And so that this uh, direct evidence in imaging of ischemia, which is a lack of blood flow, is important to determine who should get the, the therapy. And you, you can look at a, a dynamic set of these measurements. So this is actually 25 sequential images of a human heart and I think probably everybody can see here that there is likely an area of ischemia right so here's the short axis of the heart this is the right ventricle the left ventricle free wall lat called the lateral wall of the heart this is the base like this is the diaphragm right here and that's the liver the contrast, when it goes in your vein, it first goes to the right side, to, into your right ventricle. So that brightens up first, and then, you know, about six heartbeats later, the left ventricle gets bright after the blood has come from the lungs into the left ventricle. And then it goes out of the left ventricle into the aorta. Once it's in the aorta, it can go down the coronaries into the myocardium. And so that's what is causing the brightness of this myocardium. See how it gets brighter with time? And you would say probably that's ischemic, right? There seems to be a dark spot there. Everybody agree? Right? You know, this is, this is the thing about medical imaging. When you look at data and you make that decision, your sensitivity is if this person is positive, how many times, you know, what's my fraction of calling them positive correct, right? So if I call everybody positive, I, I have huge sensitivity, right? Get 100% of the people. But I fold in people who this actually isn't positive. It's an artifact or something, some imaging artifact. So it's kind of, you, you learn how to, how to read these. Most, most of this is done by human readers, and they just look at it and make an intelligent guess. They are an AI machine, right? They've, they've seen enough cases to, to make a really good guess. And you can average a bunch of slices together. So this, this one is a one millimeter section of the heart. It's a very thin section, right? And so the signal to noise at each point is not great. As you can see, there's a lot of hashy noise on this thing causing this dark stuff to kind of come and go, right, as time goes on. So it's, you're uncertain how that's going. So one way of increasing the signal to noise, that is the signal power, which should be the same average value divided by the random fluctuations, which on here you can see is this noise, is to average six of those together. So just stack six slices on top of each other, average them together. Now you have a bigger volume, right? So it's, and if you're looking at perfusion, it probably doesn't matter that it's six millimeter slice. That's still a reasonable resolution, right? So here it starts to look a little better in terms of signal to noise. The amount of fluctuation has gone down, right? And so in, in imaging, you have image quality, which we'll look at, which is your basic noise level or signal to noise. And then you have to look at the task that you're trying to accomplish. And in this case, we're trying to accomplish the task of detecting a region that has low flow. Right? And I think this, that, 
resolution is probably fine for this task, right? So here's a one millimeter slice in the long axis, same patient, right? What we were looking at before as the low flow region is this thing that seems to be sort of blinking on and off as to whether or not it's a low flow region, right? And then we average those to six millimeters. Yeah, it's still, it's, conv it's more convincing now, right? You're getting dark ones, but every once in a while it, the, it, it pops in a bright frame, right? So there, there's some uncertainty there. And so part of imaging physics, imaging engineering is how do I take this technique and stop this blinking of this, you know, perfusion deficit? How do I make it just look like a perfusion deficit like there is one there probably right but it's blinking on and off right and so this is the uncertainty is from the the imaging technique itself so sometimes it's absolutely clear that there's a, a perfusion deficit just by the difference in the signal intensity from here to here so this is normal myocardium or maybe normal ish and then this is really you know heavily um, uh, stenosed vessel causing a, a really dark spot. So there isn't any perfusion in this part. And so that's CT. And then these images are single photon emission computed tomography or SPECT. And what's the first thing you notice about SPECT images, other than the fact they're in color? They are really blurry. Right, so the spatial resolution is super low. Right, it's it's a, a, a blurrogram, and however, given it's a blurrogram, you still see there's a major chunk of tissue that's missing signal here. You expect a donut here, you don't expect a horseshoe, right? And so, given that, you would you would detect this 100% of the time and say that's a perfusion deficit. Okay, any, any question about stenosis and perfusion deficit, any, anything like that? Yeah? Uh, so under cabbage, uh, you said uh, when you take the uh, artery and we plug it in downstream uh, below the stenosis. Yes. Uh, so by doing that, do we kind of leave the tissue around the stenosis? Does that kind of uh, deteriorate? Uh, does that, that we are bypassing? Yeah. That's a really good question. I'm going to repeat the question so that it goes on the recording. Um, so the question is, if you plug in a cabbage vessel distal to the stenosis, so you perfuse everything downstream from that, what happens upstream? Have you abandoned upstream? And you have abandoned the vessel in the region of the lesion. Upstream from that, the vessel's okay. So if there's, a, if there's a branch coming off upstream from that, should be okay, right? But granted, if you don't treat that lesion, you've got a problem right there. If there's a branch coming off where the lesion is, now you have a problem, right? And so you might just say goodbye to that branch, which is possible, and you can do that sometimes. Or you can do heroic things like, do kissing stents where you put one stent through the lesion and they're side by side and the other stent goes down the branch. Right? And so that, that's done as well. It's a good question. Yeah? Um, are stents like usually considered invasive? That's a great question. So are stents invasive? I would say they are invasive, but they're minimally invasive in the sense that you don't have to crack the chest to put them in. So because you can get a stent into the vessel through arterial access, you just put a catheter and a guide wire and everything up into the, the patient's vascular system, it's truly minimally invasive, right? You just put it up there, blow it in, come out, and basically you, you hold you know, a, a piece of cloth on your femoral artery for 20 minutes and then you're done. Right? You have to take some drugs afterwards, so anticoagulant drugs, but otherwise it's, it's a really minimally invasive procedure, which is great. You're walking around the next day. Yep. So do they always 
they sometimes do like like a single foot like the body? That that's a really good question. Do you have to crack the chest to do cabbage? The answer is no. And um, a number of systems have been developed where you make ports through the ribs. Uh, so you go between the ribs in a small hole and you have essentially chopsticks or some kind of instruments that go into the chest and you try and stabilize the heart uh, while, you're, while you're doing this and, and do your anastomosis. Um, and that, you know, is, is done. Uh, there's a, a company called um, uh, Intuitive Surgical and their robotic system was built to do cardiac surgery. It doesn't do cardiac surgery very often. It mostly does prostates now, but um, it, it was built for that. The, the irony of the whole thing is it might actually be more painful to recover from having three holes between your uh, ribs than having your chest cracked and put back together, which is, you know, because it just, it's really painful. Rib, rib injuries are super painful, right? Whereas if you just like crack the sternum like this, your ribs are all intact and everything. They, they just wire them back together. Yeah. Any other questions? These are all good questions. Good. Okay, so a, another major form of heart disease that we need to image and figure out how severe the disease is, is uh, looking at the heart valves themselves and principally the ones that are of most concern are the aortic valve and the mitral valve because they cause the greatest morbidity if, if they go wrong. Uh, but also the tricuspid and the pul pulmonic valve um, can, can uh, be replaced uh, and fixed if, if they're not in good working shape. So uh, just as a review, we looked at this before. It, this is the valve plane. Uh, we have the aortic valve in the middle here with the coronaries coming off. So you have to keep that in mind when you're repairing this valve. You have, you know, the origin of the coronary arteries. You don't want to forget about that uh, when you fix the valve. Uh, pulmonic valve up here and then uh, basically the tricuspid and the mitral valve. The mitral valve has a really interesting structure. It's sort of this smile, half smile here, and it's the shape of the annulus here is kind of a horse or saddle shape, uh, so it's, it's uh, difficult to model. You can't just model it as a flat plane. Um, and so this, uh, uh, you know, when you're building prosthesis and things like that, it's, it's a difficult valve to deal with. This one's a lot simpler, um, and I, I don't think I have any Taver pictures here. I've, I'll show them next week, I guess, or on Thursday. So what happens to aortic valves, oftentimes as you age, you'll get um, a, a stiffening of the leaflets uh, and they, they just can't move as well as they could when you're young and flexible, right? And oftentimes you'll see that there's uh, calcifications growing on the leaflets and those calcifications get in the way of the normal function and eventually you basically just have to take the whole thing out and put a new one in. Luckily, uh, aortic valve surgery, uh, which is called SAVR, um, is tremendously successful. So basically, you crack the chest, you cut open the root of the aorta, and you sew in a new valve. Right? And these valves are usually made of, you know, they can be made of pig valves um, or mechanical valves. And it's, it's tremendously successful. So here's an example of a nice, fresh, you know, 18-year-old uh, aortic valve. When it's closed, they have all the leaflets are nice and co-opted so that blood cannot backflow back in, you know, to the left ventricle from the aorta. And then when it's open, it, it goes wide open. The, the soft valve leaflets just open wide and whew, the blood goes out quite easily. In someone who's uh, in their 70s, you often see a diseased valve that looks like this. It can't coapt entirely so that it, when the valve leaflets come together, there might be a little gap between them and so blood can actually go the wrong way through the valve with a little jet. And then when the left ventricle contracts, 
the pressure can only move the valve so far and then they stop. And so you have a small hole. That's called aortic valve stenosis. And it will cause a high velocity pressure jet of blood to come through uh, your aortic valve. And you can see that on MR, you can see it on echo, you can hear it with a stethoscope. Right? And under those conditions, when you have this situation where it can't open, the, usually what happens is the left ventricle, for a little while anyway, becomes like a rower's left ventricle. It gets really beefy, so it gets muscular and it's contracting really hard because it has to generate a lot of pressure to keep the amount of blood flow constant, right? That's the thing your body needs, a certain amount of blood flow. It's pushing it through a smaller and smaller hole, so it needs higher and higher pressure to get it through there, and, and the heart gets really beefy. And, um, and then, eventually, after a year or so of that, it starts to fail. It just, the, it, the muscle starts to waste away and it starts to dilate and you get diastolic heart failure. So you want to get a new valve in before you start going down that failure pathway. Right? And so imaging is a great way to look at the heart and say, well, the aortic valve you know, has a certain amount of stenosis. It's probably good for another year, but after that we should, you know, get it out of there and give this heart a break. You can watch, a, this is a really nice video on uh, aortic valve disease. I'm not going to do it here, but I uh, encourage you to watch it. It's, it's really well done. So aortic valve stenosis, um, review Openings too small, you get a high velocity jet, big pressure gradient between the, the left ventricle itself and what's in the aorta, and it eventually leads to LV failure. And patients who have this fairly typical, you know, symptoms, you know, they get angina just like you get with coronary disease, uh, they feel faint uh, and uh, shortness of breath, etc. So this is dynamic CT of a patient who has uh, a really stenotic aortic valve. So you can see that there's calcium in there. The bright signal is calcium. The uh, CT number, the Hounsfield unit of calcium is quite high because it attenuates a lot of x-rays, the calcium does. And so if you've got that on your valve, it'll show up as this bright signal. And you can see that the valve really isn't opening. You know, we should see those flaps like go up as the left ventricle is ejecting. So it's ejecting blood through a very small orifice here that's, you know, it's not even visible. And then if you freeze frame that uh, left ventricle at one phase, so let's say end systole, so this is when the, just as the left ventricle has ejected all of its blood and we should see that the aortic valves open and stuff's going through, uh, as we pan through that valve, so here we're looking at it from a long axis view, and this blue line here represents the orientation of these pictures, you can see that that valve is not really wide open. It's a, maybe the area is about 25% or something what it should be. Okay, and so you can evaluate that, actually. You can just me do planimetry and measure like what that valve area is, and then there are guidelines to decide after a certain valve area we should replace the valve. Right. So the, the pictures you get, if everything goes well, are, are wonderful in terms of figuring out who should get a new valve. Mitral valve disease, uh, now this is a valve that stops the blood from going back to the lungs. Okay. When your left ventricle uh, contracts, this valve shuts and that stops the blood going back to the lungs because you want the blood to go out the aorta, right? And, um, and so this is an interesting valve in that it has uh, these cordae tendini, which uh, essentially adhere, they're, they're like strings, and they're attached to the valve leaflets, and then they go down to a, a section of longitudinal muscle that is kind of implanted or grows out of the endocardial wall of the heart. So it's like, it's like kite strings, right? And so as, as the, the valve has 
pressure on it, those strings help keep it, it closed, right? And because the left ventricle generates a lot of pressure, right? So you, it's hard to hold that valve shut. In its normal condition, you've got a nice sort of length here. These muscles contract a bit to hold it, you know, uh, closed. And you have a, live, a lovely line here where the valve is co-opted and, you know, the, the leaflets come down like this so that positive pressure keeps them closed together and everything's working just wonderfully. Um, <clears throat> this is the first heart sound. So when you hear lub dub at lub is when your left ventricle contracts and the pressure goes up high enough to shut this valve. That's where you hear that th th lub. And then the dub is basically when the aortic valve shuts, right? So if you have a um, uh, prolapse of this valve, so if this leaflet, so if there's some reason that it's extended its shape or the geometry of the ventricle has pulled it off this way, you'll leave a gap here and blood will shoot back up through. You won't get all of the blood going up the aorta so your cardiac output goes down. Your heart has to work harder to keep your cardiac output normal. Right? You will notice if your cardiac output goes down, your heart starts working harder and then you're okay again. You don't feel faint and things like that. Um, degenerative mitral valve uh, disease, uh, you know, if some of these uh, cordae tendini get uh, broken for whatever reason, then you, you can have a leaflet that's called flailing. And when you look at it on echo, the, the leaflet actually goes in the wrong direction. It just pops up like that and, and flaps in the breeze. And, uh, and then functional mitral regurgitation is when the coaptation of the leaflets doesn't occur 100%, normally because you've had some kind of ischemic event and your ventricle has, has changed its shape because a bunch of, or a lot of the tissue in your ventricle might be dead. So if you have a big infarct, the ventricle expands, pulls everything out, and now the mitral valve cannot coapt anymore. And there, like what, who can guess how you would try and fix that? If you were just sitting there and say, hmm, we gotta fix that. How, I'm gonna invent a new technology. How do I fix that? So the valve's like this. Right? It's got a three millimeter gap or something. Take a guess. Just... So I could, you could ream out that, that valve and put a new one in. That's a simple one, right? What else? But say everything, say this stuff is still reasonably in reasonable good shape. You like graft logs in it? Yep, yeah, you could graft, just graft something here such that it has enough distance to to co-apt, right? That's one way. Just sew it on there. Yeah? Absolutely. And so when you just need them to get closer together, right? And so this so their suggestion was why don't we pinch these together somehow? And there's a couple of ways of doing that. There's basically a big cardiac vein runs out here. You can put like a clip in there, a paper clippy kind of thing, and just, just pinch it together, right? And so the whole thing comes, you know, together. Uh, and inside, you can just clip them together, right? And so it's, it's quite interesting. You just put a clip right across here. It's called a mitral clip. Just with a, with a catheter, you go up there and go clip them together. Take a look at the mitral regurg, how much is happening. Go, yeah, it's still a bit. Put another clip, cut. And then look and say, oh, that's better. Get out of there. And actually, it helps people a lot. Right? And it's a trivial thing, right? It's like so obvious. It's like, why don't I just put a clip? Right? It's called a mitral clip. And there's a big trial that just came out uh, four months ago showing that the mitral clip actually really does help uh, people uh, reduce symptoms. So in MR imaging, uh, one of the interesting things about MR is the blood signal itself, you know, gives you this uh, brightness. This, and if the the um, 
blood itself is, is swirling around in kind of a, a fast and random way, that signal will get reduced because it gets dephased, it's called. And we'll take a look at that. But what the net effect is, if you have mitral regurgitation on a Cine MR, when, you, when you're playing it, you'll see this black jet. And that's, that's the jet of the blood coming the wrong way. It's supposed to be going out here, out the aorta, and it's coming back into the atrium. And you, you can find some really great movies of uh, regurgitant jets uh, online. In fact, is that a movie? No, that's not a movie. Let me... None of these are movies. Okay. So here's another uh, example of looking at the geometry of the mitral valve um, when it's closed, showing that it's having uh, problems uh, co-opting. And so this is a kind of a tenting geometry, this height here. It should just be a flat uh, structure when you, when you visualize it in the picture. And so you can measure this uh, bowing as a, as a measure of how much prolapse you've got. Uh, and then one leaf might be prolapsed or the other. This is posterior leaf. This is anterior leaf. And that's what they're supposed to look like on MR when they're normal. And so it's, MR is a very sensitive technique for this. Echo is pretty good at this. CT is good at this. They're all good at it. Um, and here's a really interesting uh, mechanical uh, valve uh, that's used uh, to close that. Um, and you can hear this valve going click, clack, click, clack, click, clack when you, when you put a stethoscope on. Um, these aren't, aren't used all, well, I don't know. I'm not going to say anything. I don't, I don't know how often mechanical valves are used versus uh, bioprosthetic valves based on animal tissues and things like that. Great thing about this is that's going to last forever, right? That's not going to wear out. You, you're going to wear out a long time before this wears out. Problem is it might grow stuff on it, like grow you know, some clot or some other vegetation on it. OK, great. So now we can move to image quality. So we'll take a quick question break. Any, any questions about that stuff? So really, yeah. I think uh, you said when uh, you replace valves, sometimes they use uh, pig valves. And I'm wondering, uh, is there a concern 